Welcome to episode 13 of the Strategic Momentum Podcast. I'm your host, Connie Steele. In every episode, we share tips, stories, and advice from progressive leaders and how they've been able to break through their business inertia and propel their business forward. We are joined by Jason Hunter, the data science business lead for CapTech Consulting. He's been using data science to help businesses drive impact for over 15 years. Today, he shares his perspective on a hot topic, machine learning. Specifically, what is it and what it takes to effectively apply machine learning to your organization? So glad to have you on the show today, Jason. Thanks for having me, Connie. For much of your career, you have been involved in various aspects of the data science field. So what would be really interesting is to understand what triggered this long-standing interest in this field. So I think the short story is that for about 15 years of my career, I've been immersed in big data and always kind of working hands-on with it and always kind of attached to those business functions. And so I'd always look at data from the lens of either, you know, how do you save money with data? How do you make money with data? How do you save lives with data? And, you know, on, on day one in my career, I remember, you know, working for Cap One and I was swimming in their data lake of 90 million customer records. And so, you know, ever since day one, the name of the game for me was take this data, manipulate it, get it into some type of metric or some type of data model uh, that will help businesses drive impact and, you know, other things like customer conversion. And I think where it really became interesting for me was kind of, when you hit that, that that turning point where your data or your model actually leads to something that saves a lot of money or you find that new customer segment out there that is highly responsive. And you know, once you get there, then it's just a matter of constantly tweaking. And there's just, you know, so much data out there. Google's producing new data every day on individuals. So there's just no end to this. And so for me it's kind of like a game. It's just a constant cat and mouse game to figure out, you know, what new data processes can predict more things. And you know, over time, these algorithms and these machine learning concepts become more and more powerful. And those are the types of things that get me excited. So over the last few years, I trained in machine learning. And let me tell you, the world of business analysis is going to forever change once businesses start truly looking at their data. And that's what I'm excited to get into. It'd be interesting for you to share how you've seen data science and machine learning evolve from where you saw it early on to where it is today? Yeah. So back in the day when I worked for Capital One with all of those, you know, customer records, it was mostly, you know, statistics. That was the name of the game. But what is machine learning today? Well, it's really the evolution of statistics and more specifically predictive modeling. So most machine learning work revolves around taking structured or categorized data, running it through one of many machine learning algorithms. We've probably heard of a thing like a neural net, for example, and then evaluating those results to determine which factors influence some type of hypothesis like customer response for a given marketing campaign. I think what surprises most people about machine learning is that these algorithms have actually been around for 50 plus years. Uh, so if these machine learning algorithms and approaches have already been defined and we already have statisticians building data models and this up today, like why is machine learning such a hot topic? But I think it's because today you need an extremely powerful computer to actually process the big data through these algorithms. Um, so, you know, really to kind of sum it up here, I look at machine learning as using this massive compute power combined with these advanced algorithms to automate the execution of existing statistical processes. So it's really that evolution of statistics in business. But, but let me give you an example of kind of this automated statistics concept that I think will make more sense of how it applies to business. Uh, picture a statistician who's working for a marketing team of a large organization. Now, that statistician's day-to-day, they're spending the majority of their time iteratively tweaking statistical models and learning which data elements are relevant for driving customer response. But now that we have this massive compute power today, you can just take a nice algorithm and then a machine can literally run a million adapting statistical models over and over until they converge on that perfect equation to predict customer response. Uh, and we call this process of convergence just you know, a data model. 
But that's an example of how you're you're actually automating a statistician. And this is really how machine learning is going to apply to business. Help us also understand what are the different use cases and applications that you're seeing. Lots of businesses are getting into machine learning pie and they're approaching these models in different ways. So, you know, some examples here, you have retail and e-commerce organizations. Well, they like to personalize product offers. They discover related customer interests and they create location-specific offers. Then you have companies that use machine learning internally to learn about employees and optimize business workflows. Uh, I've been reading a lot in the manufacturing industry industry lately, and they're using machine learning to improve, to use their internal data to improve these product development workflows. So I thought that was really cool because they're not actually using it for uh, data analysis. Um, Then we have travel and media companies that are using it to create curated content for their buyers. I'm seeing a lot of companies jumping into real-time advertising, uh, and those companies are purchasing tools that instantly serve and kind of predict up ads. They predict and serve up ads in uh, real-time. And then uh, another area that's very popular is healthcare organizations. But what I predominantly see them doing is identifying risk factors and uh, physician fraud. And so that's kind of like a summary yeah, of where everything applies in business. So Jason, what myths or misconceptions do you see out there? I'm sure there are some maybe expectations that are not necessarily fair or real. I see businesses hiring data scientists and academics, you know, all the time. But I think the, the this big overarching myth here with machine learning is that hiring a data scientist or academic thinker will actually solve a company's data problem. So by definition here, data scientists must be able to think strategically about data, they have to understand business metrics, they have to be able to manipulate data with dozens of next generation technologies. And then they have to understand how to apply advanced mathematical concepts to the data. Is that a realistic expectation to have of any one data scientist or any one person? It really isn't. I mean, you know, just the whole art of kind of working with data, it's it's like I said, it's an art. You have to see data coming together and you have to be able to see technical processes happening without developing those. And, you know, I think what we're saying here is that, you know, a data scientist can be one or many of that laundry list of items, but a data scientist is not. um, It's someone who can transform a non-data-driven organization into a data-driven one. So in my experience, the data scientists are only effective if they already have an arsenal of data at their disposal and the business processes that facilitate the usage of that data. You know, the fact that just to recap, like the businesses put too much faith in the data scientists and the data scientists just don't know about all the business processes. So when you talked about these challenges, what are all those other factors that one needs to consider to you know, address probably the breadth of challenges that exist to implement this. And so another challenge here that I see in addition to the the person is the the tool. Um, So I see businesses putting way too much emphasis on the acquisition of a machine learning technology or tool and not enough focus on the actual organization of their physical data. So for example, I've seen marketing teams within an organization who immediately buy a machine learning tool like Pega's sentiment analysis tool for a single specific use case. Then the tool becomes the center of the company's reporting universe for years to come, which absorbs ongoing development costs. It prevents other business functions from getting in on the machine learning pie. So these tools also require complex setups and ongoing maintenance to automate these data handoffs from the company's source systems. It's really a lot of work, and those vendors are very effective at coming in and just selling the tool for its pure value, and you know they conveniently don't talk about all these indirect costs. But the biggest problem is when the need for data arises, and it becomes a six-month development cycle just to incorporate that data into that existing tool. It's not to say these tools are a bad idea or they're too challenging. You just have to actually cost them out, and you have to have a data strategy that links to that tool. So that's probably, you know, that's one of the big challenges that I see in addition to the personnel side. Jason and I talked about how companies falsely believe that by hiring a data scientist or acquiring a tool is a way to implement machine learning. And as he shared, this is a path that limits effectiveness. Next, I asked Jason, what are the other implementation challenges that commonly arise? 
What other challenges do you feel exist or, or, or in misconceptions, people think that you just need X, Y, and Z to be able to implement machine learning? Yeah. So a couple more that I see here are uh, companies and government agencies who have silos around their data. When implementing new machine learning algorithms, internal teams are usually dependent on their company data or their IT team to provide access to data in a timely manner. Now, for example, I've been on projects in a government setting that can take nine months just for the paperwork to clear to get a single data handoff. So that means we're waiting, you know, nine out of twelve, nine months on a twelve-month contract just to get data to enable the analysis. So if you extrapolated that across all the contractors and all the projects that the government secures, taxpayers are probably spending a billion dollars for contractors to wait in this, quote, data queue. Now, to be fair, there needs to be some siloing to prevent the housing of sensitive data. But I mean, the bottom line is, if you're a business and if it takes days or weeks for your analysts to get access to data, you should probably be looking into that. Another challenge I see for companies who are already exploring machine learning, and this is is probably my favorite challenge, is the analysis paralysis effect. And the world of machine learning breeds analysis paralysis relative to, you know, some of the more, you know, historical forms of data analysis. And this happens because there's so many data sources available to companies and so much complexity behind data, you know, work for businesses where they've had consultants talking for months about just the algorithm and the data with no real execution. And that's, that's a problem. Businesses have to find ways to kind of minimize that time spent strategizing. And you have to keep track of those priorities and all of the dependencies that you have across your business. Are there specifically technical challenges as well, knowing that you have to code things to uh, effectively build this out? What would you say that may be? Yeah, and that's a good point. It's one thing we haven't really talked about. You know, the real work happens at the coding level and you know what the data scientists are building behind the scenes. I see large businesses that have very similar data models driving analysis and reporting across different functions like finance and marketing. So for example, a marketing team might build a model to segment customers for marketing campaigns. Uh, But then the finance team might also segment customers similarly for some type of revenue report. It's irrelevant what reports they're doing, just that we kind of know that they're doing similar things. So these teams were talking to each other. They might actually find that 75% of that physical code behind their model is the same. And that generally never happens in businesses today because these, you know, business functions are usually siloed. They have their own tools, their own models. But just opening up the communication you can immediately see that overlap in code and start to make decisions about you know, where staff should be and where priorities should be around these machine learning concepts. Different organizations being siloed, not just in communication of needs, but of their data, that clearly causes a lot of inertia. What would be your recommendation to break through that and, and create a more integrated, not just working environment, but integrated strategy and implementation plan. Yeah. And that's exactly it. It's, uh, I mean, there's no formal name for this in business, but I would call it kind of a data strategy. The zero step here is to really just resist that urge to hire the data scientists for a tool. And that is if you're just looking to get into machine learning. You're going to have vendors knocking at your door every day selling the next data visualization or machine learning tool. But if you don't know how your data is being used across the organization and where all components of your organization can use those tools, you're going to end up with a, you know, a bigger problem than you started with. So focus on that top-down strategy. Now, what is that strategy? And, and here's what that process looks like. You first kind of identify all of the business functions that need machine learning or data science. Then identify the high-level data needs of those business functions themselves. Then link the needs to metrics and then mock up reports that contain those metrics. What you do here is look at the relationship between all of those items. And you'll immediately see where areas of overlap exist in kind of reporting and data needs. And so once you document these relationships in a systematic and network fashion, you can go bottom up and then start to connect the source data and application with those needs. And then from there, you can begin the planning process around which tools you might need to enable machine learning. Notice how we're talking about tools at the end of this process on these. You know, all too often I see the stakeholders, you know, they 
start going down this path with what they want with the data and it's not possible. And then you find out a year later that, you know, it's not possible and then you waste money. So um, that's why it's key to have the data people with the business people up front here. Two other things in this process, uh, these groups have to review the information they've collected with the actual report consumers or a dedicated business intelligence team. And then I think probably the most important thing, the key ingredient is that your C-suite, they have to be involved at all stages of this process so they can override issues that are going to inevitably arise within these business functions. Jason emphasizes the criticality of having a data strategy and the process of building it, which entails understanding the requirements and subsequently the relationships across an organization. And in the last part of the podcast, Jason talks about where this process starts, the alignment challenges that can surface, and how to continue the implementation momentum. You talk about the importance of looking at the relationships across the different functions, across the different data needs, but where does the relationship start, so to speak? Do you need to start at the top with the C-suite who have ultimately business needs and goals that they're trying to address with the data? Yeah, I think you hit it spot on in that you know you have this top-down process that has to occur first where you kind of traverse the business and capture the needs all the way from the top down to the people that will actually be running the reports and consuming the data. But then you have this bottom-up process that can only happen after the top-down process, which involves you know rounding up the data and figuring out, can you do this? You have to start with the C-suite, find out you know which business functions are responsible for reporting KPIs, and then, and then move down to those leaders. Do you find that there is alignment on what those critical metrics are to help manage and grow the business? Or do you feel that there's you know, potentially significant disconnect, which then certainly brings to light another bigger sort of business challenge? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both because... You know, once, and I'm going to go back to the documentation aspect here. Once you show these, uh, you know, stakeholders the different metrics across the organizations and kind of, you know, visually where they overlap, it is a little shocking. They're like, oh, well, so so the other group's using a tool to get the same metric. And, but I also think that these leaders actually don't really know what metrics they need. And if those executives don't know that the data might exist to do that, then they're not even thinking about it. And so, you know, you're not just tackling this from a data standpoint, you're, you're tackling it from an entire business standpoint. Yeah, it sounds like what you're doing is creating a common foundation for understanding the business through identifying the right metrics. Like what are those core metrics that truly move the needle? And then you are leveraging, you know, the power of machine learning to then implement ultimately this this broad um, analysis to fully understand the levers of the business. Exactly. And you get lots of other benefits from that too. Like you can start working on you know a centralized data governance strategy. If you're you know not filing data anymore, you know, maybe different business functions can use the same data uh, repository, which might lead to you know cost reductions and you know needing analysts. Or you know data integration team, so you get all these kind of benefits that that uh, spawn from this type of exercise. What do you think is most important to take into account moving forward once you've laid that that foundation of documentation? Uh, everybody's in alignment. You've now taken that bottoms up approach to figure out how to effectively code, develop, and implement this, you know, then what? Because things are always changing. The business landscape is changing. The metrics that you might have set prior may not be as relevant going forward. What do you then need to do to continue, you know, this momentum? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I mean what you kind of have to do with all of the artifacts from this process is kind of distill those down to, you know, different types of data science concepts. So, you know, I think when you imagine this whole you know, construct of you know, capturing all this information across the organizations and, you know, looking at how the data flows, what you can do is distill that into a list of very specific use cases at the top. 
And when you distill into those use cases, what you can do is attach a priority to each one. So it's kind of getting to that priority that really makes this actionable. And the results are always shocking. It's never, you know, whatever you think you need going in, it's always something totally different going out once you kind of rank that list. And what's great is when you have all that information documented and networked, you know, an executive can come in and say, well, why is this item at the top? And you can say, well, it's at the top because, you know, through one simple data operation, you're actually addressing the needs through all of your business functions from, you know, finance to marketing to customer service. And so, you know, it's just kind of figuring out how to weight those things and rank them that, you know, you work with the executive team on that. And then you've got that list of actions. So to close, any last words of wisdom? Yeah. So here's the thing. Data is a corporate asset. Companies have to start treating data like money because, let me tell you, once automation really starts to creep into our job, the only companies left will be the Googles of the world who are monetizing the sales of their data. And as a company, you have to learn how to wield your data and you have to do that as fast as possible if you want to keep up with the Googles of the world. And finally, what's the best way listeners can connect with you? The best way to contact me would be to send me a message on LinkedIn, or you can also feel free to email me at my uh, business address, which is jhunter at captechventures.com. Many organizations see the value of machine learning, but too often they jump into the deep end without properly assessing their data needs. Tools or a dedicated data scientist isn't going to set you up for success. You have to start with a data strategy, and that begins by assessing the needs across your organization. Once you identify and document what's desired, only then will you be able to truly see the relationships that will help you define the right tools and applications. And of course, this all has to tie back to the goals senior leadership is trying to address with the data. Thanks for listening to the Strategic Momentum Podcast. You can connect with Jason via sending him a message on LinkedIn or by email at jhunter at captechventures.com. That's J-H-U-N-T-E-R at C-A-P-T-E-C-H-V-E-N-T-U-R-E-S dot com. If you want to hear previous episodes or even get show notes from this episode, visit us on our podcast page at flywheelassociates.com slash podcast. I'm Connie Steele, and you've been listening to the Strategic Momentum Podcast.